Well, it's after nine here, so why don't we get started? We'll let the rest of the crowd kind of slowly trickle in here. So um, just before I get started, there's a couple of people that I'd like to thank. So Vico, he's been a huge support in getting these rounds started, uh, dealing with pandemic related issues, still finding time to be there to help out with this. Uh, we're also very lucky today to have Dr. Chris Bailey, one of our orthopedic spine staff with us. Uh, he is very essential in putting these rounds together and uh, he'll be able to stick around and answer some spine related questions we might have at the end of this talk. Uh, then lastly, we have a very special guest, a good friend of mine from high school, Dan Edwards. He's joining us on the call today. Uh, Dan suffered a significant spinal cord injury in 2006, and since then he's shared his journey with others as a motivational speaker, and he just continues to inspire others. So I don't have any financial disclosures or any conflicts of interest to declare. Uh, just to review these very quickly, um, we'll briefly review the anatomy of the spine, uh, including the vertebral column and the spinal cord itself. Then we'll follow that up by going over the primary and secondary cord injuries. Uh, using a case-based approach, we'll try and apply some of this information uh, to track spinal cord injury patient management. And then lastly, by the end of this talk, you should be able to distinguish between neurogenic and spinal shock and never use these terms interchangeably again. So as we're aware, spinal cord injuries are relatively common and they're just disproportionately suffered by young males. In Canada, falls are the most common etiology. However, MVCs are close second. Uh, in particular in our younger patients. The lifetime cost for these injuries is in the millions of dollars. Much of the demographic data that we have is from the Rick Hansen Spinal Cord Injury Registry. So this was started in 2004 at Vancouver General Hospital. And since then, the registry has grown to include over 30 major trauma and rehab centers, including LHSC. There's over 8,000 participants in this registry, making it the largest database tracking these patients throughout Canada. Now, Jennifer Urquhart, she's our local contact for the L at LHSC for the Rick Hansen Registry, and she was able to put in a request at the national level to get us some site-specific data. As you can see here, on average, we have about 28 patients admitted per year. Uh, our breakdown, roughly 75% males, 25% females, so similar to the national averages. And then in terms of mechanism, fall is our most common etiology, in particular in our elderly patients. And you can see a little bit more of a diverse spread of injury etiology with transport, so MVCs uh, a close second. Now we couldn't possibly do a talk on our spinal trauma without talking briefly about the bony anatomy as well as the spinal cord anatomy. So as we're aware, there's 33 bony vertebrae in our spine, uh, seven cervical, 12 thoracic, and five lumbar, as well as five sacral and four coccygeal, both fused into one. Each vertebrae is separated by a flexible intervertebral disc and your entire spine is connected to form a single functioning unit by a complex network of ligaments. Now this is an image that we've probably seen in undergrad, we've seen it in medical school, we've seen it again in, in residency. Um, this is a cervical cross section of our spinal cord. As we're aware, the brain and the spinal cord make up our central nervous system. It extends from our brain stem to between our first and second lumbar vertebrae at the conus medullaris. Uh, the peripheral regions of our spinal cord contain neuronal white matter tracts, which contain sensory and motor axons. The dorsal or posterior columns carry proprioception, vibration, and light touch from the ipsilateral side of the body, where the axons then cross at the medial lemniscus of the brainstem. The anterolateral or lateral spinal thalamic tract transmits pain and temperature from the opposite side of the body. So these fibers they enter the spinal cord, they either cross at the level or typically within one to two levels of where the sensory roots enter, and they ascend to the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus. Our lateral corticospinal tract, this is our voluntary motor pathway, so it begins in our primary motor cortex, it crosses at the pyramids of the lower medulla, and then projects to the anterior horn of the spinal cord. Now the butterfly-shaped gray matter in the center of the cord, this contains bodies of interneurons, motor neurons, neuroglia cells, as well as unmyelinated axons. The posterior horn is where our sensory neuron synapse, their cell bodies lie outside in the dorsal root ganglion. Our anterior horn is where our lower motor neurons travel out of the spinal root to efferent nerve fibers to muscle. There's also important interneurons between the posterior and anterior horn, which are responsible for our spinal reflex arcs. So a very important consideration when it comes to spinal injuries is that of stability. So what this refers to is the resistance to displacement of fracture fragments. Now there are several different classification systems, but for simplicity's sake, we're just gonna discuss the Dennis classification. So in the Dennis classification, our spinal column is thought of three parallel vertical columns, anterior, middle, and posterior. Our anterior column consists of our anterior longitudinal ligament, 
our vertebral bodies with our in intervertebral discs, uh, roughly two thirds of that. Our middle column is the posterior third of the vertebral body and intervertebral disc, as well as the posterior longitudinal ligament. It also contains our spinal cord, our nerve roots, as well as our vertebral arteries and veins. And lastly, the posterior column, uh, the most anterior aspects of the ligaments and clavum, and it includes our spinous processes, our transverse process, as well as our intra and supraspinous ligaments and our nuchal ligament. Now, when we talk about fracture patterns in general, disruption of a single column results in a, a stable injury, but it doesn't preclude from a spinal cord injury from displaced fracture fragments. If you disrupt two columns, this typically results in an injury that's stable in one direction, but unstable in another. So for example, an injury might be stable in flexion, but unstable in extension. And if you disrupt all three columns, this typically results in a, a highly multi-directional unstable injury. So when we discuss primary spinal cord injuries, there's two major distinctions, primary and secondary cord injury. So primary cord injury refers to the immediate effect of the trauma. So this includes forces of compression, contusion, and shear injury to the spinal cord. The early neurologic sequelae that we see, it's most often the result of direct mechanical trauma to the cells and the very sensitive microvasculature of the spinal cord. Now, primary injuries are also classified as to being either complete or incomplete. A, a complete spinal cord lesion is defined as total loss of motor power and sensation distal to the site of the spinal cord injury. Uh, to make this definition clear, the American Spinal Injury Association, it requires to be no evidence of any sacral sparing. So what we mean by this is no perianal sensation, no preserved rectal sphincter tone, and no flexor tone movement. The reason that they added this kind of black or white distinction is that there was some ambiguity as to whether someone had a complete spinal cord injury if they did have some sensation at a site distal to that injury. So to kind of make things clear, if there's no neurological function at the most hollow point of your spinal cord, there's somewhere along your spinal cord, there's a complete disruption, so making it a complete injury. Incomplete lesions, 90% um, of them can be classified as one of three distinct clinical syndromes. So we have our central cord, our brown saccharide, or our anterior cord syndrome. The most common of these is the central cord syndrome. So this is an injury that's often seen in patients with degenerative arthritis who suffer a neck hyperextension injury. What this does is it causes the ligamentum flavum to buckle into the cord, resulting in concussion of the central gray matter uh, in the pyramidal and the spinal thalamic tracts. Because fibers that innervate the distal structures are located more in the periphery of the spinal cord, our upper extremities are affected more than our lower extremities, giving that typical motor weakness with our weaker upper versus lower extremities. The prognosis for these injuries is variable, however, roughly 50% of these patients uh, become ambulatory and regain bowel and bladder function as well as some hand function. Now our anterior cord syndrome typically results from hyperflexion injuries. This causes cord contusion by either protrusion of bone fragments or herniated discs into the spinal canal or injury to the anterior spinal artery. So this injury pattern is characterized by loss of pain and temperature. So you can see the lateral spinal thalamic tracts affected as well as paralysis. You can see the anterior horn is affected. This is below the level of the injury. You can clearly see that the dorsal columns are completely preserved. Um, these patients can do well with prompt surgery because there's often a surgery correctable lesion. So either a bony fragment or herniated disc that would respond to decompression. But if there's no improvement seen typically within the first 24 hours, you don't see much improvement outside that period. Lastly, we have our brown saccard syndrome. So this is our classic hemisection of the spinal cord. These injuries typically are the result of penetrating trauma. They can also be seen in lateral mass fractures of the cervical spine. In brown cigar, you get your classic ipsilateral loss of motor power as well as vibration proprioception as these tracks cross in the brainstem. You get contralateral loss of your pain and temperature from your spinal thalamic tract as these tracks cross uh, typically at or within one to two levels of where the sensory fibers enter the spinal cord. Virtually all these patients maintain their bowel and bladder function as well as unilateral motor strength most of them eventually become ambulatory. Now, SCORE is an interesting diagnosis. It's really only been termed over the last 40 years since the invention of MRI. It was first described in 1982 in children as cases in which a myelopathic effect is present, but the spinal fracture instability cannot be detected radiographically. I find this pretty interesting because um, the actual spinal features on MRI of the spinal cord injury 
weren't actually um, discovered until 1987. So the reason this war exists, exists is because they didn't actually have a way to, to image the damage that was done to the spinal cord. Now the use of the term score has generated some significant uh, controversy in adult patients because typically patients that are diagnosed with score in adults, they do have degenerative changes present in their cervical spine. Now, roughly 5% of acute spinal cord injuries are classified as score, so it does remain relatively rare compared to our other etiologies. Um, and nowadays, score is classified typically as type 1 or type 2. So type 1 sclerora, the patient has a uh, neurological deficit, but no MRI findings, so this would be true sclerora. And type 2 sclerora, there are abnormal MRI findings. And this gets broken down into intraneural versus extraneural. So intraneural type 2 sclerora would be something with like cord edema or contusion, while extraneural is something like an injured ligaments around the spinal cord or compression. Um, type 2 extraneural sclerora uh, is often amenable to surgical decompression. So we discussed primary spinal cord injury, the takeaways that the damage at this point is often done. There's not much we can do other than recognize the injury quickly, mobilize the patient and get them to a surgical service for decompression. Now, secondary spinal cord injury, it is of importance to us as emergency providers because there are interventions that we can initiate to try and improve patient outcome. So when it comes to the neurological deficit, the maximum deficit is often not seen on initial examination and progresses over hours to days. So this flow sheet here is a speculated paradigm from Rosen's of a different set of their processes involved in the secondary spinal cord or injury pathway. Now the details are outside, this, outside the scope of this presentation, but I'm sure you recognize lots of these cellular pathways as they're involved in some of our other kind of pro-inflammatory states, such as post-cross patients and septic shock. Um, we do know that these pathways are affected by factors we have control over. So things such as hypoxia, hypotension, hypothermia, uh, hypo and hyperglycemia. You know, it's critical that we optimize all of these in the post-injury period to try and limit secondary spinal cord injury and recovery. So let's, let's try and apply some of this kind of rapid review of our anatomy and pathophysiology in a, in a few cases here. So looking at our list here, I'm going to pick somebody and we're going to give them a case. Let's see. Hey, how about S Sydney? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. All right, Sid. So Case one, you have a 23-year-old female. She's brought in by EMS after being found ejected from her car following an MBC rollover. They say the initial patch sounded quite benign, but they patch back in about five minutes out, telling you that the patient's now hypotensive. Um, on arrival, her vitals are as follows, heart rate of 65, a blood pressure of 70 on 40, a respirate of 16, and a saturation of 100% on room air. So this is our primary survey. So her airway is patent. There's no signs of obstruction or trauma. No concerns from a breathing perspective. Circulation exam is abnormal. So quite hypotensive. Heart rate 60, so normal. Um, with warm extremities and a negative fast. And neurological exam, she's moving her upper extremities, but not moving her lower extremities. And no other obvious injuries noted. So what are some of your kind of um, you know, emergent resuscitation considerations if you had a patient like this and you, know, you were the TTL for this case? So given that um, her heart rate is I'm still a little bit low, but probably where I would, uh, within normal, but her blood pressure is still like really soft with the fast being negative and the, the mechanism and her neuro exam, uh, definitely concerned for more of a neurogenic shock picture. Um, so given it's a trauma, I would still want to give her at least a couple of units of blood um, and resuscitate her from a volume perspective. Um, if that doesn't work, then probably move on to pressors or something of the sort if she still remains uh, hypotensive. Perfect. Yeah. And that's, that's the takeaway from the, the historical points of this case. So you know, we have a hypotensive patient. Our EFAS is negative. The patient's warm and more perfused. You know, if you look at any kind of literature in, the, in terms of trauma literature, in particular ATLS, you know, in, in any trauma, hypotension is hemorrhagic shock until proven otherwise, but out, and we suspect neurogenic shock, you know, you hit the nail on the head, but at what point is this proven otherwise? And actually, you know, ATLS, there's no actual definition for proven otherwise. Um, so just to kind of give you some more information here. So neurogenic shock, so when a patient suffers an injury to their spinal cord, typically above T6, sympathetic innervation to the heart along with vasomotor tone is lost. This leads to bradycardia and hypotension due to peripheral vasodilation. 
Now, because preganglionic sympathetic neurons originating in the hypothalamus, medulla, and pons, they're located in the intermedial lateral uh, region of our spinal cord from T1 to L2. So this is a very common question we get asked on ship. You know, at what level of injury can a patient present with neurogenic shock? And um, tech, so theoretically, any injury from above T1 to L2 can affect your sympathetic um, outflow. But since our heart is only innervated from T1 to T5, it's often said that neurogenic shock can only occur when it lesions above the T6 level. Now, to make matters worse, as you can see here, cranial nerve 10, our vagus nerve, is completely intact. So not only do we have loss of sympathetic innervation to our heart and peripheral vasculature, we have unopposed parasympathetic innervation, which leads to the hemodynamics that we typically see in these patients. So when it comes to neurogenic shock, rapid identification is extremely important. Often treatment needs to take place before the definitive diagnosis of spinal cord injury has actually been established. Now, blood pressure is often not restored by fluid alone. The problem here is that over-resuscitation can also result in fluid overload, which causes pulmonary edema and spinal cord edema, leading to a worse prognosis. So our aim in these patients, we want to maintain perfusion to the body and compromise spinal cord and reduce secondary cord damage. Now, this is a study from the BMJ. What it looked at was um, patients presenting with neurogenic shock and retrospectively looked at their initial presentation vitals. Um, an interesting note to note is that um, on average, neurogenic shock developed just after 30 minutes of the time of the injury. This box plot here shows you the vitals on presentation. The solid line represents a systolic blood pressure of 100. The dotted line represents a heart rate of 80. Now, there's no universal um, hemodynamic parameters for neurogenic shock, but most studies use these as screening criteria. Now, as you can see, um, first of all, blood pressure is a more sensitive marker for neurogenic shock versus heart rate. And it actually, if they decrease their screening criteria to a heart rate of 60, over 50% of patients that had neurogenic shock would have been missed. So if anything, this article, you know, it doesn't make me feel any better. It scares me because, you know, it cements the fact that not all patients present the same way when they're in neurogenic shock. And it's something that we need to be aware of. We need to know how to treat, but we can't rule it in or out based on vitals alone. So some really key points for neurogenic shock is that both neurogenic shock and hemorrhagic shock, they can occur together. So our loss of sympathetic outflow can prevent our normal tachycardia and stress response to volume loss. This is this goes to show just how essential our circulation assessment is. We do our EFAS, we do any free fluid in the belly, free fluid in the hemithorax, we do a chest x-ray and a pelvis x-ray, um, and blood should be given while we uh, assess the patient and assess their initial response. This is all done while we're waiting for a CT to rule out a retroperitoneal bleed. Now, speaking with some of our trauma staff, um, they, the kind of conclusion from, what, from them was that it would be appropriate to hang norepinephrine and have it ready to be started as soon as we com completely ruled out hemorrhage. So as soon as your CT shows no retroperitoneal bleed, it'd be appropriate to start your vasopressors if the patient didn't respond to your initial longing trial. Now, one last thing I want you to be very aware of when it comes to patients with neurogenic shock is that they're extremely sensitive to vagal stimulation. So any, any procedures such as suctioning, NG tube insertion, intubation, this can exacerbate neurogenic shock and atropine boluses may need to be on hand. So continuing this case, we get the patient to CT, we do our thorax after pelvis trauma scan, we see no retroperitoneal bleed, but we see this injury. So a devastating um, fracture dislocation of the thoracic spine. So let's say we have a keen medical student working with us who wants to classify this from the American Spinal Cord Injury Association. So it's actually quite simple. So there's two components. There's your neurological level, which is your most caudal segment with normal function. And then there's your severity of neurological deficit. This isn't graded zero, one, two, three, four, five. It's graded A to E based off something called the Frankel score. Um, a is a complete uh, spinal cord injury and E is normal. And B, C, and D, our, our B is a uh, sacral sparing and C and D just differ by how many of the key muscles are grade three or more. This is the whole scoring system here. Uh, there's 10 myotomes. I'm not gonna go through them all, but there's one specific movement to test for it. And this gets scored from zero to five, giving you a total motor score of 100, 50 on one side, 50 on the other. And then your dermatomes, um, you get a score of zero for nothing, one for pinprick, two for light touch. There's 28 dermatomes and giving a total uh, score of 112. So that's just, you know, on a side, we probably won't have to be doing this, you know, in our, in our tertiary care center here, but 
for somebody in the community, this would be important information to pass on to the surgical service if you're transferring a patient for, for a decompression of an injury. So reviewing our secondary injury. So the patient's heart rate's now 70, MAP is 73, has responded to the, the levo, say it's running at six mics per minute. We determine the patient has a, in, a complete injury or Asia A at T4. This is a very key medical student asked again, well, should we be giving this patient steroids? So systemic corticosteroids, they have been a much debated topic over the last 40 years regarding their use in spinal cord trauma. The rationale makes sense. We want to upregulate anti-inflammatory cytokine release at the same time inhibiting the two major products of inflammation, prostaglandins and leukotrienes. Now this has been shown in animal models to promote neural cell survival. But as we know, what works in vitro doesn't always carry on ever in vivo. Um, I'm not going to go through it too in depth, but steroids were first investigated in 1984, and there was no actual control group. It was just low dose versus high dose methylprednisolone. There was no difference between the two groups. Building off that, they did a study in 1980. This is the same thing the National Acute Spinal Cord Injury Study. Um, they compared naloxone versus methylprednisolone versus placebo. Naloxone was used because there were some animal trials that showed some maybe positive effects. Uh, in NASA's too, there was no a positive out, outcome, um, but there was a significant increase in net adverse events. So three times the incidence of PEs, two times the incidence of wound infections, and five times the incidence of GI bleeds. Um, but in a post hoc analysis, there was maybe a very, very, very small improvement seen in a very particular subgroup. So in you know good evidence based fashion. They started NASA's three and compared this very, very, very small subgroup. So received the um, infusion within eight hours of the injury. And what it what it compared was a 24 versus 48 hour infusion. Once again, there was no improvement seen, but a postdoc analysis showed maybe a very small benefit in another small subgroup by extending it to 48 hours. So really kind of um, it was it was literature that was very highly criticized in the early 2000s there were 66 subgroups compared to nasa's 2 and over 100 comparisons in nasa's 3 so when you're comparing that many subgroups there's always a high likelihood of introducing a type 1 error so finally uh, after multiple studies have been done to try and replicate those results unsuccessfully as well um, there was a study that showed a number needed to harm the four for patients receiving steroids in 2013 the american association of neurological surgeons finally spoke out against steroids and recommended methylprednisolone not be used in the first 24 to 48 hours. This was kind of hammered home. There's a Cochrane review in 2015, which uh, kind of came to the same conclusion. You can see here, this was a study that was done uh, part at LHSC in that uh, Rick Hansen database we were talking about and using a match propensity score. It compared patients that received steroids via the NASA's two protocol compared to patients that didn't. And what it found was no improvement in motor score with a significantly higher rate of infectious complications. So um, long story short, we shouldn't be giving our parents, or sorry, our patients empiric steroids. So getting back to our patient, we don't give steroids. We review their vitals again. MAP's still kind of clicking along at 73 patients on six mics of Levo. Where should we go from here? We'll talk very quickly about blood pressure targets. So in spinal cord trauma patients, we should be maintaining a map of more than 85 millimeters mercury. The rationale for this is that cord edema and damage to the microvasculature results in ongoing periodontal ischemia for days following the initial injury. Now by augmenting our systemic blood pressure, this reduces this risk by continuing to perfuse at-risk canal tissue. So similar to how our body increases its map to increase our CPP and elevated ICP, our spinal cord perfusion pressure is calculated by subtracting our CSF pressure from our map. There's been studies that have shown that um, the relative risk of poor recovery, it increases with lower, sorry, with exposure to lower levels of spinal cord perfusion pressure. This was a study that actually put an inch of fecal catheters. And what it found is that um, it was more important to avoid critical nadirs. So a spinal cord perfusion pressure of less than 50 millimeters mercury. These patients have the highest risk of a poor neurological recovery. So ultimately, if you can avoid those hypotensive episodes in these patients, that's gonna have the biggest impact on uh, promoting a good neurological recovery. The last kind of evidence-based thing that we'll talk about in terms of these patients is timing for surgery. So the STASIS trial, this showed that um, patients that had early decompression, so on average 14 hours post-injury, had roughly 20% had a tour grade at Asia improvement at six months, as opposed to 9% of patients that had late decompression, so on average 48 hours giving an odds of at least a two grade improvement of 2.8 times higher in the early versus late decompression. 
once again, it's something that we really won't have to deal with much being in the tertiary care center. But if you have to be advocating for your patient in the community, you know, there is evidence that an early decompression is a more favorable patient outcome. So just some summary, summary points for our first case here. Very, very important to recognize neurogenic shock early. As we said, hypotension and trauma, it's hemorrhage until proven otherwise. Give these patients blood immediately. They will sometimes respond to just an increase in their circulating volume. Once you've done your EFAS, your chest and pelvis x-rays, and you've ruled out any source of uh, bleeding that we can ascertain in the resuscitation room, if the patient remains hypotensive, hang your vasopressor and start it after your CT confirms no retroperitoneal bleed. Um, avoid hypotension as much as you can, and then do not give enteric steroids. So let's apply one more case here. So um, let's see who we have here. Matt, Renault, are you around? Hey, Dave, yeah, I'm here. Hey, so Matt, we've got a 72-year-old male. He's brought in by EMS. He's found at the bottom of the stairs at home. He's alert and oriented, but he's speaking in short sentences with rapid, shallow respirations. Heart rate's 95, blood pressure 110 on 75. He's quite tachypnic and quite hypoxic. So this is our, this is our primary survey. No signs of airway trauma, but like I said, shallow respirations, decreased air entry to the bases. He's warm and well perfused. EFAS is negative, pelvis is stable. Neurologically, he's not moving his upper or lower extremities, and there's no pertinent findings on his secondary or sorry, on his exposure. So, what are your kind of initial resuscitation concerns for this patient? So, can you go back just to the initial vitals there? Sorry. Yeah, no problem. So alert and oriented, speaking in short sentences with rapid, shallow respiration. So uh, of those vital signs, obviously, is increased rest rate and decreased O2 sat are probably the most concerning. Um, so given the concern for impaired uh, respiratory ability and like ventilation, I'd be worried about securing this guy's airway, uh, assuming that he's got some sort of high cervical lesion at this point. Perfect. Now, walk, walk me through what your, what your uh, plan would be for intubating this gentleman. Uh, okay, so in terms of uh, intubating, some what do you like this? I imagine you'd want to be sort of living in that same kind of neuroprotective uh, region at this point. So um, you'd want to have them in C-spine precautions and maybe attempt try to, to do a sort of delayed intubation if possible, given that it could be a bit of a tricky airway. Um, so maybe try to think of using ketamine as an induction agent um, and delaying sort of paralysis to, to a later point in time. Sure. Now, in terms of in terms of managing this patient, um, how are you going to are you going to use direct? Are you going to use glide? Are you going to keep him in his collar? Are you going to take his collar off? What what, what else are you going to do for this gentleman? So I would try to yeah, to maintain C spine precautions by having him in the collar, and then I'd probably use uh, video assisted for this sort of intubation, just so um, uh, try to maximize first pass attempts at, at all costs, and also prevent like any excessive sort of like, sort of uh, laryngeal manipulation or something like that. Perfect. Yeah, so one, one thing that I'd definitely do for this gentleman, so you know, we all remember C345 keeps the diaphragm alive and you, know, you recognize right away that this gentleman's gonna need to have his airway secured. Uh, we often forget though that our intercostal muscles, they're innervated from our lower cervical spine and upper thoracic spine. So although they might, the patients might not present in respiratory distress, they can decompensate and need a definitive airway. So just something else to be aware of there. Um, if we're gonna be intubating these patients, Remove the hard collar always. There's been studies that have shown a hard collar, um, like roughly 66% grade three or four view using direct and 22% when using manual inline stabilization. Also, the hard collar gives you a false sense of security. It doesn't actually prevent cervical spine movement. There's been numerous studies that have looked at fluoroscopy uh, and looking at movement of patient's cervical spine with a hard collar on versus using um, you know, manual uh, inline stabilization, and it's always superior to manually use manual inline stabilization. Uh, last thing is be very, very cognizant of your, your cervical spine manipulation when you're doing area related tasks. You can see here, there's actually more cervical spine movement with bag valve mass ventilation than there is with the oral intubation itself. And with that being said though, there's no actual defined extent of movement known to be dangerous for these patients. So just a couple airway pearls for you here, because this is obviously an anatomically difficult airway. Uh, and just one more time, we, we talk about inline stabilization. Try to avoid doing this. Be on this side of the patient, have your forearms resting on their chest and have their, their head between your forearms and cradling their occiput. There's already enough going on at the head of the bed, so try to avoid any kind of extra bodies up there if they're unnecessary. So getting back to our patient here, 
So we integrate the patient successfully. We go to CT, we see the following. So posterior disc osteophyte complexes encroaching the fecal sac at C3, 4, and C4, 5 with some posterior ligament thickening at these levels. So that keen medical student fortunately did a quick neuro exam before we intubated the patient. And what she found was absent light touch and pinprick below the deltoids with flaccid paralysis of all upper and lower extremity myotomes with an absent deep tendon reflexes and absent bubble cavernosis reflex. So she reports back that this patient's a Asia A complete lesion. And then we have to unfortunately tell the patient that no, we're not able to prognosticate this patient because she's in, this the patient's in spinal shock. So um, just to, as a quick review, our bubble cavernosis reflex, this is our most caudal spinal reflex we can elicit. So it's elicited by either squeezing the glands, penis, applying pressure to the clitoris or tugging on the Foley catheter. What this does is it activates uh, afferent pudendal nerve uh, fibers. Uh, there's a, uh, interneurons from our posterior to our anterior horn, and then it activates our uh, lower motor neuron uh, pudendal nerve fibers to the um, con causing contraction of the perineal muscle. And like I said, it's the most caudal spinal reflex we test, and the absence of this is an indicator of spinal shock. So what in the immediate period following a severe spinal cord injury, spinal shocks classically been defined as a complete loss of motor and sensory function below the level of the injury, loss of deep tendon reflexes and absent sphincter reflex. Um, the phenomenon was first described in the 1700s and then the term was first introduced by this fellow here, uh, Marshall Hall, an English physician and early neurologist. Uh, interesting, neither one claims discovery of the bulbal cavernosis reflex. Um, typically, bulb the bulbal cavernosis reflex um, indicates the end of spinal shock and we're able to prognosticate patients at that time. We do know now that it's not necessarily the complete end of spinal shock. So the pathophysiology of spinal shock is that, you know, even though our spinal reflex are, acts independently from our brain, there's always a baseline level of excitatory stimuli coming from our brain. When we have a lesion to our spinal cord, we lose that basal excitatory stimuli causing our interneurons here to become hyperpolarized making them less responsive to the stimuli that would elicit that spinal reflex. So that's that phase one that we talk about when you can't prognosticate a patient because they're in spinal shock. Uh, phase two, we get upregulation of NMDA, NMDA receptors at the interneurons here, um, and we get return of the bulbal cavernosis reflex typically first. We're able to start prognosticating patients, but um, we know now that there's ongoing activities at a cellular level that occur right up until sometimes 12 months later. So we're able to prognosticate a patient, but it doesn't necessarily mean this is going to be you know, the end neurological function for a patient. So our patient has a CT scan and then has an MRI, which shows uh, canal stenosis and cord compression at C3-4 as well as C4-5, thought to be um, due to prominent protrusion of a, post a posterior disc and osteophyte complex with significant posterior ligamental thickening. So this is in keeping with a severe central cord injury with a prognosis TBD, because as we said, as we said, this patient's currently in spinal shock. So just some, some kind of take home points for, key, for case two here. So inline stabilization, as we said, it's superior if we need to be managing these patients' airways. Um, spinal shock is a transient state following an incomplete or a complete spinal cord lesion, and we can't prognosticate patients in the presence of spinal shock. Now, something very important to realize is that neurogenic shock and spinal shock, they can occur simultaneously, but you shouldn't be using these terms interchangeably. They're completely different entities. So I'm going to leave you here with one last case. So we have an 18-year-old male brought into our community emerge after sustaining an injury while wrestling with his friend at the end of a summer party. He's alert, oriented, and following commands. He has no shortness of breath, no neck pain. Um, his vitals are normal and no signs of secondary injury. The CT head's normal. CT C-spine shows bilateral lock facets at C5. We've spoken with London, they've accepted the patient for transfer. So this is an actual triage note here. And this is a true case of a, a young man I've known since high school. Dan Edwards, he's an incredible person. He's an accomplished athlete and student. Well, unfortunately, he suffered an, an accident at a party when he was 18 years old. To this day, he shares a story and he's a well-known motivational speaker for all ages. Uh, Dan's kindly agreed to share his insights about the patient experience with us today. I think one of the broad takeaways from our rounds today is that we cannot do much to alter primary spinal cord injury outside of maybe preventative counseling, and we really must do our best to limit secondary injury, but perhaps and probably most importantly, we should be simply be compassionate uh, and present caregivers when we see these individuals with potential devastating injuries. So take it away, Dan.
Yay. Uh, can you hear me okay? My internet seems to be going in and out. All right, yeah, cool. Perfect. All right, well, yell at me if I lose you guys or if you lose me. Um, thank you for having me, uh, Dave. I probably have never called you Dave in my entire life. It's always been Davey, so it's kind of funny to hear you guys call him Dave. Um, uh, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Chris Bailey, and also Jim, uh, Dr. Jim. Being here, uh, and um, a lot of the times when I do. Uh, There, you lost me for a minute. Am I back? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, cool. Um, as I was saying, I think I was, uh, as I was uh, saying, it's, uh, uh, my, uh, my community did uh, a great deal for me after my injury, and uh, I wanted to be a part of a solution uh, for my community and just give back. So um, I spent a lot of time working with my, my hospital, um, in regards to mental health and also helping people um, who are going through really tough times, uh, such as myself, but also people dealing with a lot of uh, serious mental health issues, which was definitely a component after my injury. But I've never been in a situation, I've never had an opportunity, I should say, to really think about and talk about the immediate moments. And that's what uh, Dave was, had mentioned to me. Uh, he asked me what were my initial thoughts and what were my initial feelings and what was going through my head when I had my accident immediately. And I remember um, those moments when I was lying there on the ground, um, you know, I, I had some you know, shortness of breath, uh, my extremities, I couldn't feel any of them immediately from my waist down. And then eventually by the time I, by the time I got to Dr. Jim at the hospital, I had lost all feeling from the neck down and I had, when I, once I got wheeled into the, uh, the emergency room, um, there were moments of, there were moments of escape from the situation that I had had. And they came in very unorthodox ways. Um, a friend of mine's mother is a triage nurse and she may not remember this, but as I was being carted in there, um, a couple weeks before then, I was actually in her garage for a party and um, I had actually cut myself and uh, she was taping me up in the kitchen as I was bleeding all over the kitchen, which is kind of funny because the next time I saw her was in the emergency room as I was being stretched in. And I had, like I said, I already lost feeling from the neck down. And as I was being carted in there, I saw her and she whispered at me like, what did you do now? And in that moment, although it was very serious, that moment took me away from the situation. And I felt a little bit at peace to think that everything's kind of, kind of going to be okay because, you know, she's obviously, you know, cracking a joke and I understand, you know, that's, it's, it's no laughing matter, but I want you guys to understand that in a moment like that for someone going through what they were going through, um, it did provide me some escape and it, I feel like it humanized the situation a little more. Like I understand fully your guys' main priority when you get a patient in there is to keep them alive, you know, bottom line, you know, keep that heart moving and, you know, make sure they get through to the next day. And, but I'm fully conscious throughout this whole process. Um, you know, I would go in and out here and there because medication uh, by the time you know I left the I guess would you say custody or jurisdiction of Dr. Jim and uh, I wound it up at uh, UH again I was awake for the whole process of getting my halo put in and that was something that I'll never forget and there was a nurse there now obviously I couldn't feel this 
but there was a nurse there that held my hand um, as the drill was getting pushed into my face. And I obviously thought this was all a dream, but that again was another moment where I felt that everything was kind of going to be okay. And, you know, obviously, you know, weeks after that, and then obviously, you know, I guess leaving the custody of Dr. Um, Chris Bailey, um, that's when, you know, the real, you know, the real challenge for my life, you know, took place. But it's not to say that the efforts and the efforts and the, um, the job that uh, you guys would do at the beginning are for nothing, of course. Um, I know it's your job. I know, you're, you know, you punch in, you punch out at the end of each day. But every one of those moments, although they're brief at the beginning, they are significant. And to humanize that person, I understand we're all cases, you know, case number this, case number that. But there is a person on that table and they're about to embark on a journey that is going to forever change their life. And uh, I know you guys got to do your part. And me, my part right here now, you know, years later, is to just not only just be grateful and thank you for what you do, but also to remind you that some of them may not say thank you. And that's kind of, that sucks. But, you know, for the ones that are appreciative, and I know, you know they may not come out and say it, but uh, I'm going to say it for them. You know, I do want to thank you guys for what you do. Um, it's been a hell of a ride. And um, I've told people many times, and I mean it. I'm not just saying it. There isn't anything I would change about what happened. I know it's uh, very traumatic. I know it was devastating for myself, obviously, and my family. Um, but I wouldn't have it any other way. This is the only life that I get. This is the only life that we get. And um, my efforts now are to, you know, make my world a better place and being a part of an opportunity such as this is to uh, cultivate obviously knowledge and um, experience to better put you guys in a situation to help someone else and also have their experience. Um, I don't want to say pleasurable, but uh, let's use the word nurturing. You know? Let's use that word um, more nurturing in the future because that's where, um, that's all this is. This is just a one big life experience and um, we're here to make the next one better for the next generation. So uh, again, uh, I have never actually, since 14 years later, I've never actually had the opportunity to, uh, to thank Dr. Bailey. Um, I, I did mention, uh, I did go back and thank Dr. Jim for you know everything he did. Um, he actually mentioned that it was his first week in Sarnia. Uh, when he moved to Sarnia, uh, it was his first week there when, uh, when I arrived on his table. So. I'm thankful that the new guy knew what he was doing. Um, and uh, I want to appreciate, again, like I said, I never had the opportunity 14 years later to say uh, uh, thank you to Dr. Uh, Chris Bailey. So, you know, thanks for showing up to work that day. And thanks for not, you know, cutting the wrong cord or anything like that. So everything's uh, everything's good to go on this end with this guy here. And uh, I'm 33 now. No, I'm not 33. I'm 32 years old now. It's just crazy. Um, but, uh, you know, I got a lot of life to live and, you know, I'm thankful that my first stop on this journey was in the hands of you guys. So, you know, I appreciate you. And that's, uh, that's all I got to say today. So appreciate it guys. Thanks a lot, Dan. <laughs> uh, those are really important points, you know, something that we can all, you know, learn from and you know, apply and be better physicians. Um, that's everything that I have. Do you guys have any questions at all about any of the slides or any of the, uh, information that we went over. Any questions for Dan, Dr. Bailey? I said I wouldn't wait for a, a big long pause, you know, 22 seconds and then this whole thing is over. So <laughs> oh, man. Um, David, that was a that was a really good talk and um uh, I might even borrow it for my residence sometime uh, for acute care of spinal cord injuries. And, and Dan, um, you know, it, it's, uh, I, it's great what you're doing now and what you said, you know, really struck a chord. I think it's inspiring. I think it's really important to remember to be as human as we can all the time in any devastating injury such as, as what you suffered. So uh, you know, I appreciate your, your insights today for sure. And I'm glad you're doing so well. That's great. Thank you.
Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in. I think this is the last rounds we have. We have Christmas rounds still, but um, I think the rest of our, our fours are going to be giving, dropping some knowledge on you guys in the new year. So, Dan, thanks again for joining us, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, I guess we'll end it there. So, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Dave. Great talk. Thanks, Dave. Great work. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you. I think they're saying I'm awesome, Dave. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Come on, we know that. That's because you are awesome, Dan. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Jim. <laughs> right. You guys have a good day. Take Thanks, care. Good day. Bye bye. Guys.